I repeat this in Spanish. Uh, Buenvenidos a todos. Mi nombre es Roberto Mucaro Borrero. Soy del Pueblo Taíno, representante de la Confederación Unida del Pueblo Taíno. Tengo el honor para, uh, para servir como moderador de la sesión del webinario de, de CITI, uh, Intilato uh, Protección y Restauración de Nuestros Alimentos y Ecosistemas Tradicionales, Intercambio de Conocimientos con los Pueblos Indígenas, sesión, uh, tercero sesión, Gestión y Prevención Tradicionales de Incendios. Voy a, uh, ahora voy a, voy a compartir, compartir las instrucciones para interpretación uh, de la función de Zoom. Primero en inglés, después en español. Okay, I'm going to quickly uh, revert now and just share uh, the instructions for Zoom. Um, let me just share the screen, so my screen with you, so that you can all uh, see those instructions. All right, should be able to see that on the screen now. Uh, what you want to do is uh, locate the interpretation icon. You'll see it on the bottom right of your screen. Here's the image here at the bottom. You'll see a little globe. It says interpretation. You want to click on that. Then select English. Again, here's uh, some images for that. Select English and then mute original audio. Uh, this is important because if you don't mute your original audio, then you will hear both the interpretation and the, the main speaker at the same time. So again, uh, select English and then mute original audio. Right now, I'm going to switch this over into Spanish and share these same instructions in Spanish, and then we'll begin with the webinar. Okay. Let me see here. Okay, para los que hablan español, aquí es la, uh, las instrucciones para la interpretación de la plataforma de Zoom. Primero, localice el icono de interpretación. Está en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla. Aquí es una imagen. Puede ver el globito. Seleccione eso. Seleccione español. Aquí es otra imagen. Seleccione español. Después, seleccione Mute Original Audio, que quiere decir apaga el audio original. Y esto es muy importante porque si no, vas a escuchar los dos, eh, el, el, el intérprete y también el presentador. Seleccione Español y seleccione Mute Original Audio. Ahora voy a volver en inglés porque ya tenemos interpretación. Ok, I'm going to stop the share now. We're going to uh, begin our webinar. Again, uh, today is session three of the IITC webinar series, this month's IITC webinar series on traditional food and ecosystems, practical knowledge sharing with indigenous peoples. Today we are focusing on traditional fire management and prevention. So with that, I want to introduce our first presenter who will be giving an introduction, Morningstar Gali. She's from Pitt River, uh, California Tribal Community Liaison. She'll be providing the introduction. So Morningstar, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Roberto. Shimi Sunwi, greetings relatives. My name is Morningstar Galley, and I am a member of the Ajumawi Band of the Pitt River Nation. I serve as the California Tribal and Community Liaison, and for over 14,000 years, California Indian peoples have documented history of traditional burning practices that renew our local food sources, medicinal and cultural resources, create habitat for animals, and reduce the risk of larger and more dangerous wildfires that have been prevalent throughout California. The recent wildfires provided a risk to the, to the most recent census where the high risk of wildfires contributed to the difficulties within counting. California tribes have stewarded our lands for generations and understood the traditional fire management practices as a way to keep our lands cleared and fuel free. Every year that this does not occur is an increasing threat of our homelands being ravaged by fire. The predicted change in large fire frequency as we've already witnessed in these past 20 years 
has identified that within 30 years, in 2050, that there will be a 55% increase in large wildfires. We desperately need statewide policies that are spearheaded by the traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous practices that are committed to the needed fuel management that is in a dedicated and holistic way. Today, we will hear from speakers such as James Brown of the Elam Pomo Nation on challenges that are still experienced by California tribes, such as when local emergency services are not provided on reservation lands. The decreased snow melt within the Sierras and upswelling along the coast impact our natural systems. The salmon runs, the wetlands, the oak woodlands that are culturally, spiritually, and economically important to Native peoples. The rising sea levels due to global warming threaten low-lying areas, including Bay Area tidal marshes, that are critical habitat for endangered, culturally and commercially viable species of fish and wildlife. That is directly from Dr. William Carmen, a wildlife biologist in Marin County. I want to talk about the biological impact to the salmon, which includes the overall, the overall warming, the decrease in snow and ice levels, the greater variability in annual precipitation, the increased runoff and spring discharge, the ocean acidification and changes in offshore upwelling that are already threatened by dams, water diversion, logging pollution, climate change, and so more frequent fires also greatly contribute to the decline within our salmon populations that are threatened by habitat fragmentation, disease, and lack of regeneration. As Dr. Carmen noted, the predicted change will be a 55% increase in large wildfires. And that was from a report back in 2011. It's an honor to be on this panel with all of you today. And I thank all of the participants on behalf of the International Indian Treaty Council. Sasulai. Thank you so much, uh, Morningstar, for that excellent introduction. Uh, we'll move on with our panel now. And uh, as mentioned, we are going to be welcoming Jim Brown, who's a Ilam Pomo. He's an Ilam hereditary chief and elder from California. Jim, you have the floor. Thank you, Gloria. I'm honored and to welcome. be a part of Mabuika, I say in my language. I'm honored to be a part of this. Uh, and it's so important, exactly what uh, Moni Sargali said. A little lag with the uh, audio. What was that? It seems to be connecting. Can you hear me? Can't hear you yet. Oh, OK. I have a thing that says call over internet or dial in, do I? Okay, um, I can hear you. Um, I can hear you when I unmute my original audio. Okay. So I don't know if you're on the English channel, but... Um, can I press the English, I know. Did you press English and then mute original audio? Yes, when, you, when that icon came up. Okay. All right, so it looks like um, some folks did not connect or something they said. Okay, well, I can hear you when I unmute my original audio. Okay, do you want me to start then or, go, or wait? Yeah, why don't, why don't we just begin? It looks like people can hear you. Okay, uh, Hekatama, how are you, my relatives? And I'm, I'm very sorry for I'm having problems with my Zoom, but I, I do have the audio. I just wanted to talk about, I was raised with learning traditional fire management. My mother was what we called our fire starter in our community. And one of the reasons that we did this is because of the many plants, traditional foods on an annual basis. And so although our reservation is one of the smaller Indian reservations, it's only 50 acres in size. We once had 132 miles of reservation from our lands to the coast. 
And because of the colonization and the genocide, almost all California tribes ended up with a small land base. So we only are able to protect those areas. Unfortunately, a good example, I'm 68 years old. I started for my tribe as a tribal administrator at the age of 23. One of the first issues that my tribe was concerned about was the fish because we're a large fishing village. Clear Lake is one of the oldest lakes in the Western hemisphere. It's 2.4 million years old. Our tribe in 2006, we had a super fun uh, project where an archeologist found four artifacts that dated our tribe at 22,000 years old in this exact location that we're at. So we managed all the lands. One of our main, a good example, we had what they call herba senta, it still grows. That was our cough medicine. We had all these teas and medicines that we used. A good example now, to understand this, in Lake County, California, from 2012 to 20. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing the audio. Jim, uh, can you hear me? I, I apologize for cutting you off. Can you hear me, Jim? Uh, something happened with your audio. And, uh, you know, to all those listening in, just uh, please have a little bit of patience. Sometimes these technical things happen in the age of Zoom meetings. So we're just going to try to work with our elder here for a moment and get that audio back up. Can you try test again, see if we can hear you? I see the other, you have, I don't know if it's your phone that's up, Jim, there's another icon for you, but I see that that's muted. I don't know if um, that's maybe causing some of it. All right, he's just trying to reconnect. I see the other one is unmuted now. Let's see if he just comes back and then we'll continue with uh, Elder Jim. Yeah, we can go ahead and move on and we'll uh, try to see if we can get him reconnected to his audio. All right, so um, if we're gonna move on, all right, I apologize again uh, to Elder Jim for cutting off, but we're having these technical issues. So uh, with that in mind, I wanna move on to uh, Chief Gary Harrison, who's the chief and chairman of the Chickaloon Native Traditional Council. He's the Alaska representative for the Arctic Ath Athabascan Council on the Arctic Council. So Chief Gary, if you're there. Good morning. All right, yep, great, great to have you. Welcome and you have the floor. Well, in, in our area in Alaska, um, millions of acres burn every year. And how our elders used to um, take care of the wildfire was in the winter time, they used to burn the trees. And there should be a picture of it being shown here somewhere. Um, I'm getting it, I'm getting it loaded up right here. And what this would do, it didn't prevent all the wildfires, but what it did is it reduced the load of fuel so that the fires didn't go as, uh, they didn't burn as hot as they are today. And we used to have basically small fires throughout the summertime in many areas. And it not only harmed the salmon runs, the runoff from these, but it also um, affects the, the moose population and 
depending on where it's at, even the caribou population. There never used to be a lot of fires in the tundra, but nowadays they're even getting tundra fires because of the change in climate. And there's getting to be a lot of uh, fires no matter what. So it's, um, they haven't let us manage our forests for a very long time, as Jim was saying. So the forest fires are worse nowadays than they used to be and are very, very dangerous. All of these trees would have been burnt in the wintertime. And my aunt told me that in the winter she could tell where her grandfather was and her uncles because they would be plumes of smoke where they would be um, burning up these old trees. The other thing is, is uh, we used to have culturally modified trees and these culturally modified trees would um, show where the trails were, where different camping spots are, and they were more like message trees. And nowadays, those trees not only have been being cut down, but they're, they haven't been being made anymore. So a lot of the old trails, you can't find them anymore because of this. And the fire have come through and burnt a lot of them as well. These are some of the ways that we used to um, keep track of uh, not only where people were, but the trees would also tell you stories about where you were at, whether it was high fire danger. Yeah, there's a tree of my cousin Paul who um, got polio and moved to San Francisco. And he's the one who started the handicap movement. And now we have handicap access throughout the world, but it was because of my cousin there. Um, and it just shows the practice. This is uh, our elder who passed away and uh, Sewa, who many of you know, and my son Daniel digging up um, herbs for uh, medicinal herbs. Um, I don't know if you can move some more of them And this here, I'm actually in this one here, uh, right there. This is my son, Daniel, who is now our dance leader. But, and this here is the rock garden in the background where um, my aunt hauled rocks from the local creek. And we all, I helped when I was little, but they said we were more in the way and smashed fingers and things. One of the things we've been working for is um, sovereignty. And part of the sovereignty we want to work for is to be able to take care of our forests in the traditional way, which would help prevent a lot of the forest fires that they have now. And uh, that's about all I have for now. Um, if there's any questions, I could try and answer questions. All right, well, great. Thank you, Chief Gary. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you um, sharing those photos. I, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, you definitely made the link to the uh, increase of fires now and linking that to climate change. Also how uh, these increased fires also really affect the, the animal life and that affects the community uh, itself. And uh, basically how that traditional fire management links to your sovereignty and the expression of sovereignty. So I really appreciated that. So with that, I wanna move on uh, to our next uh, distinguished speaker, my good friend, uh, Les Malazar. He's from Queensland, Australia. He's a former Pacific region member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. He's the inaugural co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. And he provides opening remarks and an introduction to the film, Northern Australia Fire Management with Emissions Reduction Fund. 
So please welcome Les Malazur. You have the floor. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Roberta. Um, I presume the sound is going through okay. And um, I won't say much before the video is shown, and I'll just um, make some points at the end of the video to emphasize, I think, what are the key features here. So uh, I'll, I'll just begin by saying hello to everyone, and it's good to uh, participate with you in this uh, webinar and um, fire management uh, and protection from uh, disastrous fires has become such an important part now that uh, climate change is uh, changing uh, the situation for Indigenous peoples around the world. And um, I hope that the video will uh, get the message across clearly for you. And I'll talk to you again at the end of the video. Thank you very much. Thank you, Les. With its vast and rugged landscapes, immense beauty, wildlife, scenery, history, law, culture and ancient art, Northern Australia is one of the most spectacular places on earth. However, like all our natural treasures, it remains vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In good news though, there's some amazing work happening right here on these impressive landscapes to help combat it. G'day, Ernie Dingo here. I want to share with you a story of our fire management across the top half of Australia. It's helping to reduce emissions, benefit community and businesses, and help the environment. That fire has been part of our lives since might be the beginning of time. We've probably invented fire. Healthy country, healthy people. And fire played a big part in that. Embedded in the culture and in the land, traditional fire management have been more recently reinvigorated with the support of the Australian Government's Emissions Reduction Fund. The fund supports farmers, Indigenous Australians and other business to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's a ways of um, burning country, so we have um, green grass to grow again and it's, it's more like a burning a bit earlier than having a late fire. Our country is better looked after when Savannah fire management projects are underway. These projects restore the similar fire regime that was used for tens of thousands of years by Indigenous Australians. These projects are creating healthier ecosystems with benefits for plants and animals. We've seen all the tracks for wallabies, big kangaroo and the small one. They just came back when we had a fire. All the old people, they were telling this story about you do right way fire, you will get good rain, animal will come back, a lot of good flour, good honey. Savannah Fire Management reduces emissions by reducing frequency and extent of destructive late dry season wildfires. These huge wildfires are bad for the climate, damaging our atmosphere. This story of Savannah fire management isn't a new one. These techniques have been used for tens of thousands of years, but it's a right-way fire mob who's been combining modern science and traditional knowledge to build an industry and make a big difference in our country. 
projects are generating income by selling carbon credits to the government and businesses. With the extra income, project participants are able to spend money on more important projects to look after their community and country. It brings in more opportunities, more jobs for local people and our people as well, so that you know people can continue what we're doing today, is keep on looking after the land and our country. But we're using helicopter because we're earning good income from our carbon program and the money that we bring from, uh, from carbon, we distribute to the community and we, we get ranges and, and TOs for salary and getting more um, equipment. Every 59 seconds our passengers are offsetting uh, their flights and one of their big passions uh, and demands is Indigenous and Australian projects uh, in our own backyard. Uh, and that's why the Savannah uh, projects uh, in Northern Australia are really important. Fire was there for many reasons. Cleaning up country, um, uh, cleaning spirit, so that family can go back and use that country, paying respect for that country. And I think the Savannah projects really resonate for a couple of reasons. One is they're highly credible and tested by the Australian government. Two is it is Northern Australia, so a critical part uh, of Australian geography. Uh, but also I think the indigenous element is perhaps the most important in, it's not only a tested and credible project, but it is more holistic in giving back to Indigenous communities. There's cultural elements to it, as well as obviously the, the carbon offsetting element. Because that fire, it, it brings life. Um, and them old people, they haven't, they haven't say, you do right way fire. Um, you get them good fish, you get them good rain, you get them um, country in reward you. The science is proved. Uh, and I think with more projects becoming available, we would love to source uh, more from this part of Australia. Being a woman ranger is just great. You get to go around and see a lot of other places and you know what's happening on their land and we know, uh, they know what's happening on our land. Being a ranger is my dream job and it's really great. And taking kids around the country, learning about culture and stuff. Carbon farming is good for us because we have ranger jobs. Wunnawal Gumbra has our ranges, but it's good, good for like it's good for um, like to get people back out on country, to keep keep their um, country strong and healthy. Well, it helps to it helps employ more young people, and then you know it's helped us to buy more equipment. Saving the planet, making money, but something we've been doing for centuries. Our ancestors have been using fire for hunting gatherings, even using fire for getting right way married. So fire is a big stuff for us. Savannah Fire Mob have been combining modern science and traditional knowledge to build an industry and make a big difference in our country, people and climate that really excites me. Thank you. Um, I wanted to summarize the main points. I think that this very positive message of the video. 
First, our civilization, Australian Aboriginal civilization, is the longest surviving civilization in the world, more than 60,000 years. We continue spiritual connection with animals, plants, and places through our laws, our ceremonies, and our practices, which are farming practices. Fire is a very important tool. It allows plants and animals to survive and regenerate. But the recent huge bushfires have destroyed large regions, damaging people and properties living in rural areas and even in urban areas. This is because bush fuels, leaves, bark and trees had reached dangerous levels. And this happens when traditional burnings, what we call cool burnings, are stopped. Governments and private sector businesses now are funding Aboriginal ranges throughout our country. And a very positive message is that Indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, is being respected and is able to be passed on now through workshops, sharing information about how people are caring for country. Thank you very much, Roberto. Thank you so much, Les. And uh, it's it's really, uh, your message is, is uh, similar to the previous, is that when our peoples do not have control, right, of and, and continue with the practices that we've been following for all these generations, that's when uh, things go awry. And uh, the stark example is, as you just mentioned, with those uh, tragic fires that occurred and, and we all had our hearts broken seeing the damage to, to country out there in Australia. Um, so the, yeah, that, that idea of cool burnings, I, I, like, the, I like the term <laughs> in, many, in many ways, but because uh, they are cool and uh, it's important to do that. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we had some comments that people are enjoying really enjoyed the, the beauty of the video and seeing the people. So right now I, I want to end there. Remember, we will have time for questions for all of our uh, presenters uh, following the final uh, presentation. And I also want to let you know that uh, Elder Jim, because of the um, audio issues, we'll bring him on to uh, the next webinar that we do to finish his presentation. So I wanna just thank him for the time and uh, perhaps you know, during the question period or uh, in additional comments from our presenters, maybe Morningstar could, could add a little bit more on uh, you know, some of the techniques and, and other things uh, from that region. But right now I wanna uh, present our next speaker, uh, Winston uh, Delorme. He's a Mountain Métis. He's a community leader from Alberta, Canada. Winston, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you have the floor. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning from uh, the beautiful Rocky Mountains of Grand Cache, Alberta. We're tucked in a little corner of Alberta out of the way, so we, we don't bother anybody in the rest of the province. So uh, that's where I am right now. And the, the, you see my virtual background. That's what we look at every morning uh, when we wake up. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the scenery we see every day. So, um, I just uh, one of the biggest things that I wanted to talk about here was traditional knowledge and the traditional burning that I've learned about over the last probably twenty five years. Um, my my original job for over twenty years is working with the uh, forestry and on the wildfire side in here in Alberta. And uh, one of the things that we did a lot was uh, we worked with the communities um, in burning uh, areas around the community, the grassy areas, uh, not for a traditional burning side of things, but for uh, an actual hazard reduction side, uh, you know, has a reduction side um, of preventing wildfire from coming into a community, uh, especially you know the, the the First Nation communities or the Métis Métis settlements. Um, so one, one of the things you know, speaking with a lot of the elders in over the last twenty five years, uh, they've they've talked about um, like where they burnt. Uh, so when we when we talk to them, we ask them what areas did you burn 
uh, that were, you know, important to you. Uh, the areas that they talked about was we only burnt areas that were growing very thick. Uh, we didn't burn all the areas every every time. We only burnt areas that uh, were, you know, were thick and that were very important to to us, like so our horses could feed, you know, throughout the fall and and, and feed through the winter. Um, so the, 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 you know, the moose and the elk and, and all the animals could have fresh grass, uh, fresh vegetation throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, and the one thing that they always said is when we burnt, we waited until the, the snow had reached the tree line. And that's the only time we burnt. And we didn't, when we burnt around the fields, um, cause they, they, they did say, you know, a lot of the things that they talked about was a lot of the areas, especially here in Alberta were prairies, um, and they burnt for years, uh, to keep them as prairies. And then at one time, you know, of course the, you know, wildfires got pretty extreme. Um, so there were certain laws that came in preventing, uh, you know, people to, you know, can practice their traditional burning. Uh, they were uh, prevented from burning areas to, you know, create, keep the hay fields going so they could supply uh, vegetation or hay for their horses or their cattle. Uh, so eventually when the burning stopped, a lot of the hay areas stopped because they couldn't burn it. So eventually now uh, people couldn't afford the hay they, so they couldn't afford to keep their animals. So they started selling off their horses and selling off their cattle um, and selling off, you know, uh, animals that, you know, that were important to them, but they weren't, they couldn't afford to keep them fed because there was no way of producing any hay and they couldn't afford to buy any hay. Uh, back in those days, uh, it was a, a long ways to truck hay to a community. Um, and it was very costly. So eventually, a lot of the, a lot of that, a lot of the aspects with livestock, and uh, a lot of the aspects with, uh, you know, burning um, areas to prevent growth, uh, all stopped. And uh, you know, I, I, I was speaking to an elder the other day, and he mentioned that in the springtime we traveled all spring. And the only reason why we had to travel is because they, we kept burning a lot of areas. So as we were burning, we were moving. And we'd get to another community. By the end of the spring, the green grass would start growing, you know, and then we would make our way back to our home community for the winter time. They said that happened every year, year after year after year. And then when the laws came in saying that you cannot burn anymore, they quit traveling so they were stagnant in one location because they weren't able to continue on with their traditional you know the, their traditional burning that they were doing and a, being able to pass on the traditional knowledge to their to their to the young ones uh, to visitors the people that have come into the community one one thing that uh, there was a lot of trade routes uh throughout the area and they were open because they were burning along the way and keeping them open, going to each communities. But when the burning stopped, th those trade routes stopped. Um, there was no more. There was no more uh, trading being done uh, because all the trade routes were grown in. Uh, so it ranges from the 1930s to 1970s when there was a big enforcement on stopping. Uh, you know, uh, as we would call it, uh, traditional burning, as society would call it, would be creating wildfires. So, su successional burning was key to the communities, uh, to the people, uh, you know, and when somebody comes and says, you can't do it anymore, it's, it's really tough on a community, it's really tough on the people because uh, that you know the elders um, they've they promoted it for years to say you know we've done this we've burned 
we've burnt the grass, we've kept the land open. Now the land is closed. And that, that was the exact words from an elder um, the other day. He said, the land is closed. And at one time it was open. The one thing that uh, the elders have always spoke about when it came to burning around lakes um, is that they never burnt after the waterfowl nested. So they waited, they try and burn before the, you know, the ducks, the geese, uh, any waterfowl would come in from migration. They would try and burn before then. But as soon as they started nesting, there was no more burning. Um, they, they knew when time to burn. They knew, they knew exact the moments when to burn. If it didn't feel right to burn an area, they'd leave it alone. Um, they, you know, a lot of the elders that I've spoken to over the last 25 years said it was all based on gut instinct on should we burn that area, um, you know, or should we not? You know, uh, one of the stories that the, when I lived up in Northern Alberta was uh, they always knew when the trappers were coming home because uh, the trappers would start uh, lighting off areas in the spring. Um, once the, of course, when the snow hit the tree line, they would start burning off areas and then the community would see the smoke in the distance and they would know that the trappers were coming home from their trap lines. So they would get things prepared and get things ready for, for all the furs that were coming, um, you know, and, and, and possibly any moose or, you know, elk or whatever animals that they, they harvested that they would have be prepared to, uh, and then at that time they would start packing up and they would start moving. Um, so the elders that you know, I've spoken to over the years, um, when they talk about this traditional burning and trying to pass on this knowledge, they, they, they are very saddened by, by the situation because uh, they, they've, they've looked at it where society has changed so much uh, with technology, uh, with uh, all kinds of things coming in. Um, one of the things that they, they said that they, we've gotten away from is uh, looking after our land. Uh, when, we were, when we required firewood, we go onto the land and clean up all the stuff that was laid on the ground, um, you know, uh, the dead and down. We would clean that up, use that for firewood, use that for smoke houses. Um, we'd use it for, you know, our, our sweats. So there was a lot of stuff that they used, but the only reason why they could do that is because the, the forest area was clean because they burnt it off. And uh, they said, now you look at the forest, the, the, you can't even see 10 feet into the forest. Uh, it's really thick. Um, so it's pretty, it's hard to see animals in the bush. So when you're hunting, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to see, uh, you know, any dangers coming. Uh, he said, there's, there's lots of things that have happened over the last 30, 40 years that has really changed society in, in regards to uh, the traditional knowledge. Um, that, you know, like nowadays, uh, I mean, I, I grew up the first 20, 19, 20 years of my life, I grew up, uh, you know, hauling water, and outdoor, outdoor outhouse. Um, that's what I grew up with. And, and, and I, I learned a lot from that. And now the generations now, uh, they got indoor plumbing and you got a furnace, you can go turn the heat on. And uh, there's, there's, so there's lots of things that have changed. And so that traditional knowledge um, and the traditional burning practices are also being lost. And, and I, I, I know talking to elders, they just, they, they said it's a sad time. It's a sad time that that knowledge is being lost. Um, and, you know, like in my area here, I have, you know, very few elders left and I, I sit down and have conversations with them. And they said at one time, this whole entire valley was just grass for miles. You could see your neighbor 40 miles away. You know, you could see the smoke coming out of his chimney, out of his house, 40 miles away. But 
He said, now you, you can't even see 20 feet in front of you because the, the bush is there. Um, he said, we used to have, you know, you know, two or 300 head of horses. And now what do we have now? We have like 20. Some people don't even have any anymore. And they used to be horse people because everything is so restricted now. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, they weren't saying that the traditional burning was the issue. It's just the, the practice that the people that have started fires, um, uh, like I would say breaking the law, starting fires, uh, has caused a lot of uh, a lot of uh, anxiety and a lot of uh, uncertainty when it comes to traditional knowledge and the, and the burning that has been passed on, you know, from generation to generation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Winston, for that sharing. Uh, we appreciated hearing about your homeland. I was especially inspired by uh, your consistent reference to the elders, which is uh, very important for us uh, in these days, especially in a time of COVID, you know, when so many elders are being affected uh, by the pandemic as well. But that idea of that discontinuity with traditional knowledge is, is, is really an important thing to uh, to think about it and to to discuss and and uh, to build strategies around but um yeah this this whole history of of your burning and how the uh, it affected uh, the tradition how the stopping of the burning affected the tradition when you say now that things used to be miles of plains and now you know they're, they're interrupted by bush and and how that's affected even the community's interaction so all fascinating i want to thank you for that we're going to be opening up for questions and comments soon, but I know that uh, Chief Gary uh, did say that he uh, wanted to just add a little bit more uh, to his presentation. So before we open up to the floor for comments, uh, Chief Gary, did you want to uh, share a bit more before we move on to that next part? Uh, yes, I did. If you've seen some of the pictures that were shown, one of the things you've seen was a lot of uh, dead spruce trees. And one of the reasons why is because of the spruce bark beetle is out of control now. And when we used to burn in the winter time, it also used to keep the spruce bark beetle under control. There's uh, all the dead trees. And when nowadays there's a lot of spruce bark beetles that are very much affecting the forest and therefore it also makes it easier for not only lightning to strike and make more forest fires but it also is producing more um, fuel and what happens when you have so much fuel on in in the fires is that it burns down into the ground and that affects a lot more than if it was just a surface fire and would just burn off the top. Much of the forest in the past burned off the top and it didn't get down into the ground. And when it burns down into the ground, it affects the regrowth. And many people know that the regrowth brings a lot of uh, food for the moose and uh, other animals. And when they have more food, then there's more food for the people. So this is a, a cycle that is uh, gotten out of hand. So I, I just wanted to add that, that the burning also kept the spruce bark beetles down. The spruce bark beetles are naturally occurring. They've been here for thousands of years, but they were kept under control. So with the burning. So that was an important point I forgot to let you know. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief Gary. And uh, yeah, you anticipated my, my question to you on that because I was wondering if those spruce bark beetles were invasive species or not. Because I know in uh, New York region, they have, uh, uh, there's a real issue with uh, the Asian longhorn uh, beetles that have really wreak havoc on the trees and, and increase the chances of uh, these large fires. 
so thank you for that. Thank you for adding that. I don't know if uh, before we go on to uh, any questions or comments, if any of the other panelists have anything else they want to share before we go to the comments. I see Winston coming on. Yeah, Winston, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I just want to, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, I just wanted to make a point too, is you can really truly tell what was prairies in the last 40, 50, 60 years, because a lot of the trees that are growing in that area are all young, young trees. Um, like for example, in, in, in my area here, uh, the, the only older trees are the spruce trees and they're very sporadical throughout the valley. So a lot of the aspen and poplar trees that come in were due to the fact because of the burning had stopped. So now all the suckering in of the aspen and poplar trees and the willow is, as you can tell by if the tree looks short and very small, then you know that at one point, probably only 40, 50 years ago, that there was prairie there. And, and you, you, can, you can see it all over the country. Thank you so much for adding that. Very important information and uh, gives us a better picture of what's going on in your homeland. So uh, right now we can open up uh, for any questions or comments uh, for any of the panelists, just to remind you, Elder Jim will come back on next week uh, to finish his presentation. So um, please uh, be sure to tune in. I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit more about next week, more towards the end of our session here. But, um, you know, feel free to type in any questions into the chat. And also, if any of the presenters have questions for the other presenters, we would welcome that to any kind of dialogue in exchange. So with that, I'm looking into the chat. I don't see any questions coming up. So maybe I'll just start off. Winston, you know, uh, some of our other uh, presenters had mentioned the, um, the effects of climate change uh, also on the, the burning in their areas. Do you see any effects of climate change? Is that also a factor in, in what's happening in your area? Well, at, at one point, um, with aspen and poplar trees, uh, it would never burn. We use that as a fuel barrier and, you know, as a, as a fire guard for a community. But over the last probably 10, 15 years, uh, we've noticed that even aspen, it burns through aspen because um, the trees are dried out, uh, like less, less water. Um, I, I know there's an area uh, in 2018, there was, a, there's a, there was a big wildfire up in northern Alberta uh, that came close to you know, a community, but it, it did one community came close to another one, it burned right into a community. Um, that whole entire area, I, you know, for many years, there's lots of water and there was no way it would burn. Um, and they found in the last probably five years that the water levels were dropping and the moisture was disappearing. So now it turned into an area that usually doesn't burn into an area that will burn. And, and, it, and it grew to a significant size fire and it rolled through everything, like it rolled through the aspen, it rolled through the tamarack, and those are normally trees and, or you know types of vegetation that will slow fires down. But it's, it wasn't slowing it down; it was just continuing on. Wow! Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, we have a question coming in for Les. Uh, Les, uh, how did uh, the Gooby Gooby get support from the government for the emission reduction projects? That's a question that's coming in for you. Thanks uh, very much. Yes, in fact, um, it really is part of the important message that um, I was trying to convey that um, we've always had problems with the government working against our interests and, and our traditional knowledge being disrespected. But the severity of the fires in Australia have caused uh, 
governments and the public to really react because this whole country is a, about fire burning. And it's the cool burning that happens during the off seasons, during the cooler months, that has kept the environment from getting these huge bushfires, which climate change is now generating. So government has actually um, encouraged traditional knowledge. The, the firefighting services have um, brought in people who hold the knowledge to work with them, to work out how they should be doing burnings uh, during off seasons. Um, and governments have been funding ranger positions all over the country um, as uh, employment initiatives. And so we have ever increasing numbers of rangers going on. For example, in the Gubby Gubby Butchula area, uh, which is my traditional area, um, we have two ranger groups, two separate organisations, and 30 or 40 rangers who are active the whole time, and not just on fire management, but other forms of uh, management, including animals uh, and, and the environment. So um, it has become a very positive action taken by the government. And you would have seen in the video that companies like Qantas, who get passengers to offset their um, carbon uh, emission by investing in projects like fire burning and Aboriginal communities. So um, it's the positive that's come out of the severity of the problem in Australia with climate change. And while Australia has a long way to go to have a good climate response, nevertheless, um, a lot of dollars are pouring into the work that Aboriginal communities do. And more and more, um, our people from one community, one area, are going to other areas to learn from the elders and the, and the people who have good knowledge and carry it on. There's workshops that are happening um, both um, with our own mob, but also with um, the firefighters, uh, who, as I said before, greatly respect traditional knowledge and will, will look for and use traditional knowledge. And there was a part in the video that talked about how science, where they refer to modern science, and traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge are coming together. I, I use these words carefully because we have science as well, and it needs to be regarded as science. But And this has been respected. And our biggest scientific organization, uh, which is government, um, is actually um, a leader in traditional knowledges um, being uh, recorded and passed on from generation to generation. So, um, so this has all come about to get this wider support, which we never had before historically. We never had this sort of support coming to our culture, to our lifestyle and so on, but nature has made it a necessity in this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Les. Uh, we do have another question in the chat, but before we go to that, I want to come back to Morningstar who wanted to just share a little bit about the relationship between uh, baskets, uh, basket making and fire prevention. Yep, morning star. Thank you, Roberto. Yes, that's something that we weren't able to share earlier in terms of the relationship with traditional ecological knowledge and that um, for basketry, for basket making practices throughout California that um, the fire is essential that we have to burn our bear grass, we have to burn um, all of our different um, willows and, and sedge so that we're able to utilize it and that it is able to grow back in, um, in a way that, that is straighter and that we are able um, to use it for the next season. Great, thank you so much uh, Morningstar for sharing that. Winston, I want to uh, get this question over to you. 
Um, have others been using herd management like goats and sheep to offset non-productive times where burning cannot be performed? I, yes, um, there's been a few. There's been a few instances in in the in, in Alberta where, uh, for example, uh, the city of Lethbridge uh, utilized uh, goats. I think goats and sheep both to do veg management uh, in around a lot of areas. If you guys don't don't know Lethbridge, Lethbridge is like right in the middle of the prairie. So there's lots of grass, lots of lots of grass in that uh, in around that city. And there's also lots of valleys, there's, there's a river through it. So there's, there's the, the topography, you know, plays a big havoc, especially if wildfire was to start in that community. So they used uh, goats and some sheep to, uh, you know, take down the vegetation in a lot of areas, uh, pinch points, uh, a lot of uh, areas where the, the fire would start rolling up hills. Um, so they, there is a lot of uh, um, practices going that way, especially here in Alberta. I know uh, ATCO has used uh, sheep to um, cut down the vegetation underneath their power lines, um, using you know, especially the big transmission lines. Uh, instead of uh, cutting trees down uh, or waiting till the willows get high, they've used sheep to, you know, to cut the vegetation down. So there, there is programs like that. There, there's just not enough programs like that um, uh, to to bring forward. And and you know, it's 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 in small stages here in Alberta. Thank you, uh, Chief Gary or Les. Are there is there anything like that going on in your areas? Um, not that I know of. Right, so not that he knows of in Alaska. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't pick up all the points uh, that were being made there. Um, but uh, let me come back on, um, on something that I, I was... Um, uh, oh, that's right. The point I wanted to make um, was that our fire practices weren't just as required, they were actually seasonal. So it was, it, it was like hunting, uh, there would be a season. And so it was a regular thing. It was all the time carried out. And basically you can see from the background to my um, presentation um, of country that where fire has gone through, that very quickly after a fire, the plants regenerate and if they don't regenerate then in fact they shouldn't be there or it wasn't country that where fire was occurring we we, we do have rain forests and, and other important areas where you don't want fire to be going through but um, uh, it's an important part of the seasonal calendar uh, for these things to happen and as I have mentioned the um, when you stop that it doesn't take long. It just takes uh, two years, three years, and all of a sudden, and nowadays with the increased temperatures, all of a sudden you have wildfires. And we have populations, non-Indigenous populations now who live out in the bush, who move out for um, rural lifestyles and so on. And of course, they're losing their homes, losing their lives and so on. Not such a great risk for our mob. Oh, and the other point I wanted to make is that one of the very big positives as well is that our younger generation now are going back onto country because of this and, and are um, caring for country once again, whereas the, the welfare system you know, moves people into townships and makes them sedentary. Well, we're not meant to be sedentary. We're meant to be moving around all the time, and this um, caring for country with the with the seasonal burnings and so on has regenerated our cultural um, activity. And of course, when you're caring for country and you're moving around, then you are telling your stories and you're passing on information about places and importance of things and the way of doing things and so on. So 
um, as I have been saying throughout this, it's been a very positive experience. The negative experience of those wildfires, they're, they're catastrophic, but the positive experience is that um, the first peoples of Australia have been brought back into prominence and importance in Australian lifestyle. Thank you so much, Les. I was thinking about that video that you've shown, and, and uh, I remember the moment when uh, the uh, Aboriginal sister said that, uh, you know, being a ranger has allowed her to go to different communities and hear those stories uh, from different peoples. So that brings me to a question in the chat, uh, and this is open to everyone, about um, the idea of sharing of knowledge between tribes and nations, particularly for those communities where fire has not been used or, or fire management has not been used for a long time. Uh, the question is, what are some of the considerations or concerns uh, with these cultural exchanges? Have any of your communities uh, that retain this uh, fire management knowledge, this sovereign uh, uh, traditional knowledge, shared this knowledge with other communities who are trying to seek uh, you know, these, these practices or bring them back or reinvigorate them into their communities. So this is generally open to any of the panelists and, and Morningstar. Again, talking about uh, traditional exchanges between communities on fire management. Oh, yes, Les? Thank you. I'll, I'll just jump in quickly again. I, I just wanted to add that even this webinar and the other that you do in these series are an example of all of a sudden people becoming active to share information, to share knowledge. And, um, you know, uh, hopefully people will see that there's a way of using this for greater cultural uh, advantage uh, this discussion about fires, because I know in, in North America, as it is in Australia, um, the damage of these fires is so great and um, that they want to avoid these fires if they can. But of course, um, climate will dictates that fires will start. They start from lightning strikes or even campfires or, or other things. And, and once they start in the wrong season, then, uh, yeah, they can't be controlled and there's a lot of damage that is done. So um, people coming together for meetings, for workshops to talk about this has a bigger advantage because there, there are other things on that seasonal calendar that need to be talked about and so on. So um, for us, carbon offsets has been advantageous um, and governments have looked to us to... Uh, meet carbon targets. So, uh, you know, that sh should really be, particularly for North America, I think, be um, a, a serious point of discussion. And of course, the problem becomes um, where non Indigenous communities are living, they're worried about people coming and lighting fires where they live. They're worried about, you know, their houses will burn down and so on. Um, but but they, they, they have to measure that against other impacts that are coming from climate change as to why this, in, this activity, this movement, these coming together of uh, Indigenous groups is so important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Les. Uh, do any of the other panelists have any um, comments about this idea of cultural sharing? Um, I do. Okay, we'll go uh, Winston and then, then Morningstar, you can go right after him. You gotta unmute yourself, Winston. That was Chief Gary. Yeah, well, um, one of the things that this is all tied to is uh, language and the language Many of our languages are almost extinct, or some of them probably are extinct. And one of the things that's happening here is Chickaloon has been one of the only tribes in the Atna Nation who have been <clears throat> trying to 
renew the language. Uh, yet recently, some of the other villages have uh, come to us and have, we've started having language classes with some of the other villages. So the knowledge sharing is starting here um, with language. And that's one of the biggest things to culture and knowledge transfer is the language because how you say things in our language has a lot to do with what's really going on in the world. And I myself am not an original speaker. I learn a little bit here and there. Um, but when I was young, I used to hear the elders talk so I know when I hear some of them, I understand a lot of them. But that's one of the big things is the language barrier to the indigenous people's knowledge. And as most people know, they've tried to wipe out indigenous people's language throughout the world, which is wiping out whole histories, whole libraries of knowledge. Um, so in small ways, we're starting to transfer some of this knowledge, but it needs to be a much larger concerted effort. Thank you so much, Chief Gary. Morningstar, you had uh, some additional comments? Sure, um, in both the cultural sharing and the question that Chris um, posted about how to get Indigenous youth involved, that we have um, annual traditional youth camps and gatherings where we um, teach about the importance of fire, teach of the importance of cultural burning, um, connect that with the salmon and have, um, you know, salmon bakes and preparation along with it. And so really um, at a young age, just in terms of, of having our, our extended family and um, the larger uh, cultural youth camps, um, we always make sure and, and share that information with them. Great. Uh, Winston, are there any youth led initiatives going on in your area? Or is that something that needs to be uh, further further developed? Well, I could say at this time, it needs to be developed. Um, when I worked for forestry, we did a lot of uh, school talks. So we, we sat with the kids, uh, you know, at the in the schools, in the communities, and we talked about um, Lost audio. Sorry, you hear me now? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so we, we talked to kids in school uh, in the communities, especially in, in the indigenous communities, and we talked to them and asked them those questions. What do you know about, you know, the traditional knowledge? And a lot of the kids didn't know. Uh, and so we, we brought in uh, elders in the community and we talked about it. Um, that I, I can't say that that is still continuing on today. I, I did it um, when I was working in forestry because you know I felt that that was that was needed. Uh, but definitely, it needs to be implemented on bringing back that knowledge and sharing that knowledge because a lot of the elders, like I, I, I can say for like in my community, um, you know, two years ago we started we had about thirty elders. I think we're down to like nine now in our community. Uh, a lot of them have passed away. So when they when they go, a lot of that knowledge goes with them. And and I I just uh, feel that it's not being shared enough, or there's no uh, push to get it shared to you know to our youth, not only to our youth but to middle aged people like me, um, in, in in going on into the future. Thank you, very important points. And, uh, you know, for those thinking about projects and programs, you know, here's some good examples of, of, of keeping these, supporting these projects to keep these traditions going. Um, we did have uh, a message or a comment that was shared by, um, let's see, Maritza, 
but she was asking about uh, fire burning and land management projects that exist. And, and you know, the panel has been about that, what's been going on in Australia, what's been going on in Canada, in, in California. Uh, these are projects that are led and implemented by sovereign nations. So we've had some examples. And in the chat, uh, Les did uh, expand on that a little bit. So that, that's great if you want to check out uh, Les's comment in that chat. But um, there was another comment here by uh, Miguel Perez Gibson and asking about, and I think you've, some of the panelists have touched upon this, but I don't know if they want to expand on this. But uh, would the panelists agree that dominant culture uh, focus on controlling the environment needs to be reset by native peoples uh, focus on having a relationship? In other words, uh, you know, this domina domination of, of people over nature instead of working uh, with nature, I think was a, was a theme that ran through everyone's. But does anybody want to expand on that a little bit? Um, I don't want to expand on that any at all, but I did want to mention that we do have the only indigenous school in Alaska. It's called the Yanida'a School, and we do teach our culture, our language, uh, traditions, but we also teach um, English, science, um, other mainstream um, education. And it is hard to get the younger people involved. Um, even when they come to our school, they see a lot of the other kids going to the main school and they feel like they should go there and they're missing out when it's exactly the opposite. When they go to the mainstream schools, they're the ones missing out on our school because we teach all of their stuff. Plus we teach our language and culture. So it's, um, it's a difficult thing to include the youth in today's modern age because many of them think that uh, that's old stuff and we're never going to come back to it. Yet, when we look at the past, even the language helped win world war. So somehow we have to bring in more youth and maybe uh, Chris, who's uh, our IT guy on this here, maybe he has some ideas on how we can get the youth to participate more. Um, it is something that we all need. And many of us who haven't been youth for about 45 years or 50 years um, are a little disconnected from time to time. And I would say I'm probably one of them because even my children are not youth anymore. So, um, but my son, oldest son does work at the school. So he's more connected than some of us. So I, I just think that that is a, a thing that we need to work on even harder and can and need all the help we can get. Thank you, uh, Chief Gary for that. And you know, there was a comment in the chat uh, from our uh, relative calling in from Russia, uh, talking about promoting uh, this culture uh, via all social institutions like kindergarten schools and paying attention to their communication channels, possibly like uh, getting TikTok influencers involved since many youth are on TikTok, that this might also be a way to help uh, bring this back up. So uh, Les, I know you did have a, a, a comment and I think that this will be probably uh, our last comment uh, for this session as we're, we're coming down to uh, the close and I'll share some, uh, some, a little bit about next week's program and also just give uh, folks a chance to you know, make any closing uh, remarks. But uh, Les, and then I see Chris Honani has his hand up. Thanks, uh, Roberto. Um, I thought I will get in to mention the um, the Declaration on Resilience, which came out of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings um, about six or seven years ago, 2015 it was. Um, 
It's called the Malta Declaration on Governance for Resilience. And I put a copy of the, um, the link on, on the chat panel there. Um, and I want, just want to, it's a very good declaration. It's an important one. So I wanted to first say that climate change is making this the equaliser. Um, where Indigenous peoples' voice can be heard uh, in the problems that are arising uh, from climate change, these drastic weather changes, and um, that the attention to Indigenous peoples and the resilience of Indigenous peoples to survive the environment, to survive through you know, centuries and even through colonial uh, uh, impacts, and so on um, is a very good sign of the resilience that exists in our communities. So this discussion that we have been having about uh, fire management and gaining wider support and respect for traditional knowledge is also a part of that resilience. So some people might find advantage in looking at that declaration. It, it only has about four paragraphs on Indigenous peoples, but it's an eight page statement. And for Commonwealth countries such as Canada, like Australia and New Zealand, um, uh, it's a tool to argue with governments also about this, and why it's so important for Indigenous peoples to be part of the um, response and reaction to climate change. Um, but I think it also doesn't just apply to Commonwealth countries. There are 54 Commonwealth countries. Um, it also applies uh, across all countries of, of how governance should deal with resilience and the relationship with the Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you so much, Les. Uh, we'll go to Chris. Uh, also note that uh, Winston has shared in the chat a great video uh, regarding Northern Alberta. Uh, sp speaking about uh, traditional knowledge and burning. Uh, Chris? Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow up on um, what Chief Gary had said and to kind of give my thoughts on how we can encourage more Indigenous youth to get involved in this work. And I think um, one of the easiest ways to do that is to take your your kids or your, your younger family members out into um the forest into onto the land and um build that connection with them um have them uh become more um involved in in the land and, and taking them out to do things like going camping going fishing hunting um just just increasing the amount of time that they're they're able to spend um, in our forest, um, that way they're, they're able to build that connection and then they'll be able to learn why it's important to protect these areas and to, um, to teach our, our youth that um, these areas are under threat and um, their children or grandchildren or future generations might not be able to experience the same things um, as we are today. So um, that's kind of how I have been able to build my relationship to our forests and our lands is to just spend time out there, you know, go camping, you know, turn, turn off the phone, disconnect and, and actually be there on the land. And that's, I think, is going to be one of the best ways to encourage more youth to um, get involved in this work. Thank you. Great, great, great words, uh, wonderful advice. And I hope uh, people take that to heart. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes left now uh, before the close of our session. So if uh, Morningstar or Chief Gary or Winston would like to make any final comments, just really, it would need to be really quick. Um, I don't see that anyone wants to make any final comments. Well, Winston, no, but I wanna thank everyone for, uh, um, listening and participating in a good way. I think this has been a very good uh, uh, webinar. See, some of us, we even got to figure out this new language too. <laughs> Great, Winston. I, I just wanted to say like, um, 
the, the biggest thing is, you know, we've been talking about youth the last uh, five, 10 minutes here. Um, uh, I think I, I agree with Chris, it's going to be hard to install that back into the youth and Chief Gary, uh, I, I agree with you 100%. It's going to be hard to install that into the youth. But if, if we don't, if we don't start somewhere, and we don't push it, and we don't um, letting it out there, um, nobody's going to hear it. So, uh, and, and if we don't hear it, uh, it's going to eventually be lost. And all that we have needed to learn from the past will be gone and we'll have to come up with our own, um, our own, our own things to survive to the future. You're muted. You're muted. Well, Les, any closing uh, words just very quickly? Well, Les is muted. Yeah, uh, no, thank you. I, I've made plenty of comments. Thank you. Muted, Roberto. Thank all of our participants for today. Uh, Les Malazar, Morningstar Gali, Chief Gary Harrison, Winston Delorme, and Elder Jim Brown uh, for being here with us. Thank our interpreters, uh, Rebecca and Jimmy Clark, of course, Chris Hanani for helping uh, pull this all together. Um, please tune in next week. We'll be talking about uh, restoring original biodiversity and removing invasive species. As we said, Elder Jim will be back on to talk, uh, to finish his presentation next week, but we'll also be joined by uh, Bumpy uh, Kanahele from Hawaii, Irvin Carlson talking about, uh, from the Blackfeet, talking about the Intertribal Buffalo Council, Juan Leon Alvarado, who will be uh, tuning in from Guatemala. So uh, again, my name's Roberto Mucaro Borrero. It's been a, a real honor for me to uh, facilitate this session, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much. Ha -hom. Thank you.